there's a sweet, sweet presence of the Lord that's in this place. Amen. Amen. Um, there's an old song that says, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I feel the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. There's nothing like God's presence. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to be here with you today. And, um, and don't, I hope you don't sour on me too much because we'll be back again next week. So, <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll try to, yes, enjoy it while you can. So we'll, I'll do the best I can. But uh, first, give honor to your pastor, Brother Boyd and Sister Boyd. And, and we're praying that he recovers well. We're glad that his procedure went well. And now we're just praying that he heals really quick. And, um, you know, I don't want to throw any accusations, but I do find it very curious that the week before ladies' conference, you know, so we'll see. I don't know. We'll see. But he's got that built-in excuse now. So, no, I'm sure he didn't plan it, you know. But it is, it's good to be here. And um, I, I just want to preach something that's on my heart. Hopefully it will bring encouragement and um, help somebody today. Amen. If you'll turn with me to the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, chapter 14, and I'm going to be reading, starting verse number 10, reading to verse number 12, then I'm going to jump to verse number 21 and 22. It may look a little different than what you're reading. I'm reading today from the New King James Version, if that's okay. Exodus, chapter 14, verse 10 through 12. The Bible says, and when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, so they were very afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Verse number 21, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground. And the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. By the help of the Lord today, I want to preach on this thought. And really, my title is more of a statement. And it is this, trust the way maker. Trust the way maker. Why don't we just lift our hands and ask God to minister to us by his word. God, we thank you for what you've done in this place. We ask that you would... Minister to us now, God, by the power of your word. Speak something encouraging to us. Let us leave this place different than what we came. And God, we will give you the praise and the glory for it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Everybody said in Jesus' name. God bless you. You can be seated. Fear is a powerful and primitive human sensation. Fear is part of life and it's a God-given emotion. We rightly fear many things that are necessary to fear. Fear can be used as a tool to help us identify problems and solve them effectively. Fear serves as a red flag that warns us when something needs attention. Fear is powerful and then it can be used in a positive sense. Has anybody here ever experienced fear? In a positive sense, fear prevents you from doing certain things. Fear is the reason that I've never jumped out of an airplane. Can I get an amen? Fear is the reason I've never gone bungee jumping. And fear is the reason why if we pull up to a local hole-in-the-wall restaurant and there's no cars in the parking lot, we just pull out and drive and go somewhere else. Amen? Fear prevents us from making certain choices in life. So it's powerful and it can be a positive sensation. Fear can also, however, produce negative outcomes in our lives. 
Fear and anxiety thrive when we begin to imagine the worst possible scenario. An out of control imagination can be a breeding ground for anxiety and fear that will steal your peace. It can steal your joy and it can rob your very life. Fear and doubt are common problems from which none of us are exempt. Nobody here is exempt from fear. Nobody is exempt from experiencing it at one point or another in your life. Maybe you are going through a time right now of fear, doubt, and anxiety. You don't know what tomorrow holds. Today, our world, our world that we live in, is an uncertain place. The world that we live in is very uncertain. It's unstable at the moment. Globally, nationally, in our own personal lives, in our homes, we have no doubt the past few years experienced instability, uncertainty. There is fear of what tomorrow holds for our families Fear for our friends, fear for our finances. There's no doubt that this has affected the minds of many, and perhaps maybe some of us here today. Maybe some of us, our imaginations have indeed become breeding grounds for fear and anxiety. But it's my hope and prayer today that the Lord extinguishes those negative thoughts and surrounds us with his love and his hope. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. In fact, I believe that God has led us to this place of uncertainty for a purpose. Somebody say a purpose. And that purpose is to prove himself. You may not understand it right now. You may not know why you're going through what you're going through. You may not know why you're experiencing fear and anxiety and uncertainty, but I believe that God has orchestrated these events in our lives to prove himself. We see time and time throughout scripture where this is the case. One of the most amazing portions of scripture is in the gospel of John chapter 6. It's a story we're no doubt all familiar with. Jesus observed a hungry crowd of at least 5,000 a little more than 5,000. And then after he got through preaching, he, he noticed they're hungry. He observes the crowd. And then he turns to Philip and he asks this question. He says, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now, they didn't come prepared to feed a crowd. They didn't ask for $5 for a pizza party. They didn't, they didn't bring the food necessary to feed these people. And Jesus knew they didn't have enough food. And his question purposely, understand this, if you read the text, it purposely brought doubt into Philip's mind and uncertainty. Because his word tells us in John 6, 6, that after he asked this question to Philip, where are we going to get food to feed all these people? The Bible says, this he said to test him. He said this to test Philip. He He brought uncertainty and doubt into his mind to test him because the Bible says that Jesus knew himself what he would do. So he introduced doubt. He introduced uncertainty, instability into Philip. How are we going to feed this crowd? What are we going to do about this situation? Testing Philip. Why? Because Jesus knew exactly what his actions would be, what he was going to do, what miracle he was going to perform. Just a few short verses later, Jesus then takes a mere five loaves and two fishes to perform one of the greatest miracles ever recorded in Scripture. That place of doubt, that place of uncertainty, however, was necessary for that miracle to occur. It was necessary in order for Jesus to perform that miracle. So today I bring you this word. You may be experiencing fear. You may be experiencing doubt and uncertainty abounds in your life, but he brought you here for a purpose. He brought you here for a reason and he is in control and he is the way maker. He will make a way. So 
Let's put our trust in him and let's believe him in spite of our doubt, in spite of our fear and what we're going through, that he is going to perform what he promised. Amen? Why don't we just give God a hand clap of praise? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody say God is good. All the time. All right, we have some old school saints in here today. Exodus chapter 14 finds Moses and Israel trapped and being pursued by Pharaoh and his army. God had miraculously brought them out of Egypt. They, God delivered them from slavery in Egypt, if we remember the story, the ten plagues and and everything that they went through, all the years of suffering and bondage, and God had finally delivered them. Their, their prayer requests that had spanned years and years and years without being answer, answered had finally been answered. God had broken them out of their chains. He had sent a deliverer, and he had brought them out of Egypt. So it was a time of celebration. It was a uh, a, a great time. There was, there was dancing and there was singing and there was smiles on every face. Finally, they were tasting freedom. Finally, their prayers had been answered. Isn't it great when your prayers get answered? You know that feeling, right? You finally get that answered prayer. Well, then they leave. Their prayers are answered. They're, they're singing. They're dancing. But then they find themselves suddenly backed into a corner. Backed into a corner. God had now strategically placed his people in a, a, an uncertain position. He told Moses at the beginning of the chapter in Exodus 14, verse 2, he said, you shall camp before it by the sea. So he sent them to the sea to set up camp. He sent them to this specific location. He sent them there for a purpose and for a reason. He said, I want you to go here and camp right here by the sea. So here stood God's people in his will, going where he had told them to go, doing what he had told them to do, but now they found themselves trapped. They were trapped between Pharaoh's army who decided to pursue them on one side and then what we, where we learned to be the Red Sea on the other side. So there's nowhere to go. They can't turn around and go back. They can't go forward because they'll drown. So they are placed in this terrible position. No way out. And God had intentionally placed them there. And so you can imagine the frustration on the children of Israel. They have been brought out of bondage. They have been brought out of this place of slavery. They obeyed God's word. They followed Moses, the deliverer. But now they have been placed in an uncertain position in a place where fear has now taken hold of them. As they lifted up their eyes and observed the situation, as they looked behind them at Pharaoh's massive army, as they looked before them at the Red Sea, they became frustrated towards their leadership. They said to Moses, they said, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to, to perish in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Here they are, they are so distressed. They are so afraid. And they are worried so much about their current situation that they actually are desiring to go back into bondage. They're desiring those chains be placed back on their hands and on their feet. They're desiring the, the, the crack of the whip on their back again as they, they labor for the Egyptians. That's how, how tense they were in this situation. Frustrated at Moses, no doubt frustrated with God himself. Why did he bring us here? Why did he place us? If he knew there was going to be trouble, why did he direct our paths to this location? Did anybody ever ask that question? If I was going to go through this, why did God send me here? If I was going to experience this pain and this anguish, why did God send me to this place? He knew before I got here what was going to happen. So why am I here? That's the question that 
they were now asking Moses. But the Bible says that Moses listened to their complaints. He listened to their frustration. And then he responded with a word of faith to these frustrated people. He said, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. Forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Interesting here that we see this multiple times in Scripture, where in times of trouble, in times of extreme circumstance, God tells his people to just stand still. Today, you don't have to do anything. Today, you don't have to fight. Today, you don't have to worry. You don't have to stress and struggle. Now, that standing still in and of itself is a lot harder sometimes than just picking up a weapon and fighting, isn't it? Just trusting God to do the work that he said he was going to do. But God is saying, today, hold your peace. Don't fight. Don't struggle. Don't do anything. Just stand still. Just stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Moses, when he spoke these words... He saw the same trouble his people did. He saw Pharaoh's army behind them. He saw the Red Sea before them. And he had no idea how God would help them in this situation. All Moses knew was that God certainly would help them out. Moses understood that they had been brought to a bad place. They had been brought to an impossible place. A place, a breeding ground of fear, anxiety, and uncertainty. But Moses also understood that God would somehow make a way. Moses had seen it too many times in his life that God was indeed a way maker. He had brought them this far so he would certainly deliver them again. And then the Bible says that Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land and the waters were divided. That's the most amazing part. The waters parted, that's amazing, but dry land stood underneath them. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. As Moses, as he stretched out his hand over the sea, God miraculously parted the waters and Moses and the children of Israel crossed on dry land. Pharaoh and his armies, they would pursue. But God, as we read, closed the waters covering the chariots, all the horsemen, Pharaoh's entire army. Israel had been delivered from the hands of the Egyptians. And God made a way because he is a way maker. There's a song that says, when our backs are against the wall, and it looks as if it's over, he'll make a way. I would dare say that to the Israelites, it looked as if it was over. Has anybody ever felt like it's over? We often say and sing these words. We lift our hands and worship to them. But I wonder if we ever stop to truly realize what is involved for this to happen, for him to make a way. For the Lord to make a way when none seems to exist means that we must have been allowed by his power and his purpose to get into a place where we cannot escape without a miracle. We do believe in miracles, amen? And we desire them, but we often overlook the soil which is required to experience a miracle. Now, I'm, I'm not a horticulturist. Does anybody in here have a green thumb? No? You just buy those fake ones, right? <laughs> Hang them up, just make sure they look good and clean. But I, I worked for a few summers with my uncle who had a landscaping business, and I learned that there are certain times and seasons where you plant certain things. And there, there are certain types of soils that are required for certain plants. You, you don't just take a, you know, whatever plant you want to in, in the middle of December and just plant it and it'll grow. The soil has to be right. It has to be, uh, it has to be created for that time and for that season. 
you need the right soil. The soil required for a miracle is impossible. The impossible. Let me say that again. The soil that's required for you to experience a miracle is the soil of the impossible. God who loves us beyond our own understanding often seeks to send us into fearful, dark, and impossible places so that only he can miraculously change our direction. God seeks to change our direction and make a way. He seeks to be a way maker so that we will lose focus on ourselves and look to him. God arranged the situation at the Red Sea from the start and to the finish. And he will bring us eventually to a place in our lives of impossibility because he is the one who loves to deliver and demonstrate how much he cares and controls all things. We love to have great church. We love to have great prayer meetings. We love to feel his spirit. We love to hear great preaching. The praise and worship team always does such a great job. This is a a great place. Who loves being in God's presence? I, I was thinking about that as everybody was praying. I was thinking there is just nothing like the presence of the Lord. Young people seeking the Holy Ghost. The sick coming forward to getting prayed for. Those that are dealing with depression and personal problems, able to lift their hands in the presence of Jesus. Let him come down and we feel his presence. It's a great place. But it can be tough to go from this place. It can be tough to go from his presence and to walk out the doors to a place of uncertainty and fear. When we escape the confines of the church, of, of that, that feeling, that little taste of, of heaven is what it is that we get here. To be here, to experience it, to feel it, and to turn around and walk out the doors, it can be tough. Because we walk out, go, we, we go back into that world of uncertainty, of instability and fear and anxiety. We leave this place and we, we head back to that world. But as we've learned today, God will move us from a place of comfort. He will take you from this place. He will remove you from this place, feeling his presence so freely, and take you to a place by design of uncertainty to prove himself and make a way. God seeks to, in your life, in your home, and what you're going through personally right now, he seeks to prove himself to you, to, to work a miracle in your life. So he has purposely caused the soil of impossibility to build up in your life so that he can eventually make a way for you. We read about the miracle of the loaves of bread and the fishes that we referenced earlier. The Bible says that after this, immediately, Jesus made his disciples to get into the boat. And go before him to the other side. So immediately after this wonderful miracle, after he had presented uh, uncertainty and doubt into Philip, how are we going to feed everybody? He feeds the 5,000. Everybody's happy. They're full and, and, and there's still food left over. The Bible says that after that great service, after that great miracle, after he had just moved on their behalf, immediately he made his disciples... He directed them to get into a boat and said, meet me on the other side of the water. Meet me over there. I'll I'll meet you over there. Then he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, the Bible says that he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat, somebody say, but the boat. The boat where the disciples were was now in the middle of the sea tossed to and fro by waves in a massive storm. In a massive storm. The Bible says, for the wind was contrary. It was fighting them. And the, the waves were, were whipping around. And it was, it was a dangerous position. You ever been on a boat when the waves start getting a little uncomfortable? You see the, see the sky turning a little gray and it's time to go back to shore, right? Well, they couldn't go back to shore. This was it. They thought that They had met their end. This was going to be it. They weren't coming off this boat. But God had, Jesus had put them on the boat. He constrained them. He 
He told them to get on. He commanded them to get on the boat. And he knew what was going to happen. He knew where they were headed. He knew that the storm was coming, but he constrained them to get on the boat. He took them from a place of the miraculous, a great altar service, if you will, and put them on the boat and sent them into uncertainty. Jesus immediately had taken them from that place of comfort to that place of uncertainty. But this, so that he could once again prove himself and make a way and show that he is indeed a way maker. Because the Bible says in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea, walking on the very trouble, treading on the very trouble that had now surrounded them. So today as we've been brought to this uncertain place, I say to you, do not fear. But in the distance, in the middle of what you're facing and going through, if you can look out and see Jesus, the author and finisher, and if you'll put your trust in him, then he will make a way for you. If you'll stand with me today. You may be in a place where it it feels like it's over and there's no way out and you just feel surrounded and boxed in. But if you'll just stand still and trust in him, this season of uncertainty and fear and doubt, anxiety will pass. We see it all throughout scripture where God, in impossible situations, just makes a path of escape. Makes a path of escape for you, but a place for him to meet you where you are so that he can get to you as well. Isaiah 43 16 through 19 says this, Thus say is the Lord who makes a way in the sea and the path through the mighty waters, who brings forth the chariot and horse, the army and the power. They shall lie down together. They shall not rise. They are extinguished. They are quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall you not know it? And then he says this, I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Today you may be in your own personal wilderness. You may be in a desert, a dry and thirsty land, and you you don't know how you're going to escape. But I'm here today to say just trust the way maker. Trust that he will provide. Trust that he will supply your every need and that he will work a miracle in your life. And as we close today, I wonder if you, where you are, if you just want to lift your hands. If you'd like to come up front, if you'd like to come and pray, I'd like to invite you to do that as well. But let's just trust in him right now. Come on, I I don't know what you're going through or where you're at. But Jesus wants to minister to your, your heart right now. God wants to make a way for you out of no way. God wants to take that soil of impossibility right now and and spring up a miracle in your life.